Okay, welcome to chapter 23, the respiratory system. Uh, we're going to dive into it much deeper than you probably have ever done in the past. Um, if, if you ask yourself, why do we need a respiratory system? You, the answer you're probably going to give now is we need oxygen. Uh -huh. But there's a lot more to it than just we need oxygen. Um, we also need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Uh, we also use the respiratory system to help maintain blood pH. Uh, so we have to know a little bit about pH uh, to understand some components in this chapter. And there's a quite a bit of anatomy to know. So we got to follow air from where it enters the body, say your nasal cavity, until it gets all the way down to the very end of the respiratory tract, which are these little air sacs called alveoli. And then we got to look at the physiology. So what do we do with that air once it gets down into those lungs? Uh, we're also going to learn some other components that kind of connect all the dots as far as uh, why we need oxygen. How do we get it to the cells? What is it used for once it gets to the cells? Uh, and then don't forget about carbon dioxide. We got to we got to see uh, how do we get it from the cells back to the lungs, and then how do we exhale that carbon dioxide? So there's quite a bit of anatomy in the beginning of this chapter. There's quite a bit of physiology. Uh, I always recommend take the physiology and break it down into smaller topics, and then eventually try to put it all together. Uh, but we're going to start pretty general, the main steps in respiration. So there's more than just breathing involved, and we'll talk about kind of the entire process. Uh, the anatomy of the respiratory system, we can divide it a couple different ways. We can divide it into upper versus lower respiratory tract. So you've probably heard of, you know, someone having an upper respiratory tract infection versus a lower respiratory tract infection. Uh, where is the divide, right? What, what divides the upper from the lower? We're also going to divide it functionally. So your respiratory tract kind of has two main functions. One is just to move the air. We got to get that air from the atmosphere down to where we can do gas exchange. And when we're moving that air, we're also conditioning it. We're getting it ready uh, for gas exchange. So we might have to filter it clean it up, we warm it up, we humidify it. That's all done in what we call the conducting zones. Then when it gets to what's called the respiratory zone, we can actually do gas exchange. Uh, this gas exchange occurs between the air and the alveolus. So alveolus is singular for alveoli, which are the little air sacs. And we're going to do gas exchange between that and the pulmonary capillaries. So this is basically an interface. There's a divide between the air in the lungs and the blood in your pulmonary capillaries. So this first kind of uh, set of gas exchange is called external respiration. But we also have to look at what's called internal respiration. That's going to be gas exchange between the blood in your systemic capillaries and your actual tissue cells. So there's really two places where we have to look at gas exchange. We're going to learn about what muscles are involved in breathing. Uh, we call breathing pulmonary ventilation. So you have to be able to ventilate the lungs. So what muscles are utilized during both, both normal quiet breathing, but also if we need to start to move more air, we call that forced breathing. We'll look at some pressure changes that have to occur during inhalation and exhalation. Air moves because of a pressure gradient. So you got to have a higher pressure somewhere and a lower pressure somewhere else if air is going to move. If pressure is the same, air doesn't move. So obviously moving air in and out of the lungs requires you to change the pressure inside of your lungs. So we'll take a look at that. We'll look at what's called lung volumes and lung capacities. We'll look at, again, there's two places we have to study gas exchange. We have to study the external respiration. That's between the lungs and the pulmonary capillaries. We also have to look at what's called internal respiration. That's between the systemic capillaries and your cells. We also have to look at how do we get these gases transported. Uh, that's more of a cardiovascular function. 
But how does oxygen travel in the bloodstream? How does carbon dioxide travel in the bloodstream? We're going to look at what's known as oxygen hemoglobin affinity. So this is how strong hemoglobin holds on to oxygen. Uh, this is going to involve you know, changes that occur so you can load up the hemoglobin with oxygen, but then also unload it. All right, because hemoglobin has to grab onto oxygen, but then eventually let go of it. So what changes that affinity? How does hemoglobin know to hold on to oxygen tight in one place, but then let go of it in another place? And then finally, we look at how the nervous system controls your breathing. Uh, breathing is all kind of uh, regulated by the nervous system. So how, how does the nervous system get you to breathe faster and deeper? How does it know when you have to when you can slow down your breathing rate? So those are all the little topics. Uh, basically, uh, the first few here are all anatomy, and then we get into the physiology in the second part of the PowerPoint. So let's take a look first just at the general idea, right? And you really want to think about you know the very end first. So what do we need oxygen for? Uh, it's not good enough at this point to say, oh, just so we don't die. Um, what do we actually need that oxygen for? Uh, and it has to do with cellular respiration. It has to do with the fact that for us to get energy from glucose or fat or protein, we need oxygen, all right? We are aerobic organisms, meaning we need oxygen. It plays a vital role in the production of energy, ATP. So every single cell in your body has to be able to make energy, ATP. So we have to get this oxygen from the atmosphere, right, from the environment, to every cell of our body for cellular respiration. All right, so this takes a lot of steps. All right, the first step we're going to, you know, once we get into the physiology, is known as pulmonary ventilation. So that's our medical phrase for breathing, all right? You have to be able to move air into the lungs during inhalation and move air out of the lungs during exhalation. So the combination of inhalation and exhalation is called pulmonary ventilation. When we're talking about ventilation, we're obviously going to learn about respiratory muscles, such as the diaphragm, external intercostals. We also have to talk about pressure. All right, pressure changes that occur in your lungs. Next thing we got to do is we got to be able to do gas exchange between the air in our lungs and the blood in our pulmonary capillaries. So again, that process is called external or pulmonary respiration. Uh, this is driven by diffusion. So we got to kind of remind ourselves what diffusion means. Basically, things move from high to low. Uh, so oxygen is going to be high in the alveoli. It's going to be low in the pulmonary capillaries. So oxygen goes from the alveoli to pulmonary capillaries. Carbon dioxide is going to be high in the pulmonary capillaries, low in your lungs, so it'll diffuse the other way. All right, so, so simple diffusion. Uh, we also talk about transport, so it's not really on here, but you know we also need to talk about how these gases get transported. And then we look at the, the other form of gas exchange called internal or tissue respiration. So now we are at the systemic capillaries, and we're looking at how the oxygen goes from the systemic capillaries into your cells and then how carbon dioxide, which is made inside of your cells, diffuses into your blood. So two different places we study the specific gas exchange that occurs. Uh, and then obviously don't forget about cellular respiration. That's where you're utilizing the oxygen and producing the carbon dioxide. Uh, if you think about it, the respiratory system really only carries out the first two steps uh, because once you you know get the oxygen into the blood it's all about the cardiovascular system uh, so cardiovascular system carries out this third step as well as transporting the gases so even though this is the respiratory system chapter 
you also need to remind yourself that the cardiovascular system is playing a huge role uh, in this process. All right, so that's kind of the big picture. Uh, let's learn some of the anatomy. Uh, so like I mentioned on that, on that list, we've got a couple different ways to divide the respiratory tract. Uh, one way is more functionally. So we have what's called the conducting zone, which is basically moving the air. And then we have the respiratory zone, which is where you can actually do that external respiration or gas exchange. So another job of moving the air is you also have to get it ready. So it has to be warmed up. So the, the lungs don't like cold air. We filter the air. We don't want any particulates, any pathogens. We also add moisture to the air. So the conducting zone starts at your nose so obviously you breathe that air into your external nose it goes through the nasal cavity all right you do a lot of filtering there you do a lot of warming and humidifying there then it moves to your throat or pharynx so that's going to start back here and go all the way till it enters your larynx or voice box because that houses your vocal cords then the air goes down the trachea or windpipe Again, we're still trying to filter it, get it ready. You got two lungs, so that trachea will split into two, what we call primary bronchi. Uh, bronchi is plural for bronchus. There's a right bronchus and a left bronchus. And those are going to divide. So these airways are going to keep dividing into smaller but more numerous airways until they get to pretty tiny airways called bronchioles and then the end of the conduction zone is called the terminal bronchioles that's not the end of the respiratory tract that's just the end of where all you're doing is moving and filtering and humidifying the air then the air from there and this is all microscopic so we're taking a, the very very end of the respiratory tract and blowing it up a little bit this is the respiratory zone so you got what's called respiratory bronchioles, and those can participate in gas exchange because they actually have little alveoli sticking off of them. And those alveoli is where you can do the gas exchange. Then you have what's called alveolar ducts, alveolar sacs, and then the most important structure for gas exchange are the alveoli. And those are these little guys. They kind of Some people think they look like little grapes. But those are the little tiny microscopic air sacs uh, deep down in your lungs. All right. So this is dividing it functionally. Are you moving the air, warming the air, filtering the air, adding moisture to the air? Or are you actually doing gas exchange with the pulmonary capillaries? Anatomically, we can divide it into upper versus lower. And the divide is typically your larynx or voice box. So anything above it, we consider upper respiratory. So that's going to be your nasal cavity, your throat. All right. And then anything below is lower respiratory. All right. So again, this is just an anatomical upper versus lower. Um, kind of arbitrary. I don't know who came up with the fact that let's just say the larynx divides it. Uh, and I've found that some books will put the larynx in the upper. Other books will put the larynx in the lower. The best thing, I think, is the vocal cords. They're right in the middle of the larynx. They make a very good kind of divide. So if you're above those vocal cords, you're upper. If you're below, you're lower. All right. Okay, so now we're going to start all the way from the beginning, look at a little more detail. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things to identify on this picture. Um, if we were to divide it anywhere, it's right here. These are the vocal cords or vocal folds. So anything above here is upper. This is all upper respiratory tract. And then we'll start to enter that lower respiratory tract uh, as we get down below the, the uh, vocal folds. All right, so... A couple things that might look familiar, you've got what's called paranasal sinuses that surround your nasal cavity. Uh, if you remember, the frontal bone has a sinus, the sphenoid bone has a sinus. Oops, where is that? Oh, I don't have it labeled, sorry. 
This is the sphenoidal sinus. Um, you also have sinuses in your ethmoid bone, not shown here. You have sinuses in your maxillary bones, not shown here. But air is going to enter your nostril, right? Here's a nostril. Enters this nasal cavity, all right? This is the nasal cavity. It's going to have a lot of mucous membranes. Uh, it has what's known as the nasal concha uh, or turbinates. Uh, their job is to just make that surface area larger. Because if you have a large surface, that air will get filtered much better. So it does a really good job of filtering the air. Uh, there's a lot of blood flow in your nasal cavity. That's why you tend to get nosebleeds a lot. And that blood will warm the air, right? Blood is warm. So if you can run air over you know, tissue that has a lot of blood flow to it, you can warm up that air nicely. And then it also adds moisture. So your nasal cavity, you might not think it does a lot, but it does a lot of the conditioning. Warming, filtering, humidifying. All right. Uh, the bottom of your nasal cavity is the hard palate. So that kind of separates your nasal cavity from your oral cavity. Uh, there's your tongue in there. As the air moves through the nasal cavity, it will then enter what's called the nasopharynx. So this is the upper part of your throat or pharynx. Your, your pharynx actually has three parts. Nasopharynx, because it's kind of behind the nasal cavity. Oropharynx, because it's behind the oral cavity. And then laryngopharynx, because it's basically kind of behind or above the larynx. So the, that's the three regions of your pharynx. Uh, soft palate, so the hard palate here, soft palate. And then the bottom of the soft palate is the uvula. It kind of dangles down. And then on each side of the uvula, you have the palatine tonsils. So it shows one of the tonsils there. Notice up here is the pharyngeal tonsil, or adenoid. Uh, so remember, your, your main tonsils are pharyngeal, palatine, and lingual tonsils. So those are all there strategically located because you're going to have pathogens trying to get in uh, through the respiratory tract and uh, digestive tract. Uh, oropharynx, uh, the epiglottis. So your epiglottis is a piece of elastic cartilage that is a lid to the larynx. This is your larynx. So in this position, right, air can move down into the respiratory tract. When you swallow, two things really happen. The larynx moves up and the epiglottis moves down. And that covers this opening here called the glottis. And then the food or, or drink will go over that epiglottis and slide down into the esophagus. All right, so in this position, you can breathe. Uh, if you were to swallow, this would move down and cover that larynx. Uh, inside the larynx are two folds. Uh, the vestibular fold is this superior little fold here. Um, that's not going to produce sound. But below it is the true vocal fold, which will vibrate and produce sounds. So we'll take a closer look at those vocal folds. But they're inside the larynx. All this purple stuff represents cartilage. So the epiglottis is elastic cartilage. You have what's known as the thyroid cartilage in the front. Uh, sometimes we refer to that as your Adam's apple. Uh, cricoid cartilage kind of goes around the entire respiratory tract. So you see a little bit of it back here and a little bit of it up there. So the larynx has a lot of cartilage just so it doesn't collapse, right? We don't want it to close off. Uh, and then you have the esophagus in the back. So it's posterior, and obviously that's for food. And then the trachea, more anterior, which is for air. So a lot of anatomy um, in this kind of mostly upper uh, respiratory tract. Uh, these are pictures of the larynx. Just giving you kind of a few different views here. This is an anterior view, this is a posterior view, and this is a mid-sagittal section uh, looking at some of the internal structures. A lot of the things you can see in all three pictures. 
like the epiglottis. All right, again, it kind of is a um, a lid that can move up and down and close off that that respiratory tract. Uh, the hyoid bone, if you remember the hyoid bone um, from AMP1, that's going to help kind of keep that larynx open as well. Uh, the thyroid cartilage is best viewed in the front, so that's the largest piece of cartilage. It's going to protect those vocal cords that are on the inside. So you see most of it here in the front. You see a little bit, little bit of it here on this sagittal view, and a little bit here. So that's the thyroid cartilage. Then there's a big piece of cartilage called the cricoid cartilage. And the cricoid cartilage is best known for being the only piece of cartilage that actually goes around the entire circumference of the respiratory tract. So you can see it here in the front, you can see it here in the back, you can see it uh, here as well. All right, all the other pieces of cartilage are either only in the front or when we get to the trachea, they don't connect in the back. So that piece of cartilage doesn't really go around the entire circumference. So these are all cartilage uh, of the trachea. And they're kind of shaped like the letter C, uh, where they're kind of not a complete ring like the cricoid cartilage. There's a few other little pieces of cartilage uh, that are in the, the larynx as well. Cuneiform is this little piece. Corniculate is this little piece. And then retinoid is this piece. Uh, but the main pieces are the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and epiglottis. Inside the larynx, you see the two folds. Uh, again, this upper fold is called the vestibular fold, plays no role in speech, but it can help close off the larynx uh, when you're swallowing as well. The inferior is what we would call the true vocal cord. So it's the one that can produce sound and give you your voice. All right, so that's larynx. Then we, well, we can look at the larynx again, I guess. Um, this is showing kind of how those vocal cords are moving. So they can kind of uh, adduct inward or abduct away. Um, they can loosen or tighten in order to change the pitches of your voice. Uh, we're not going to really dive uh, deep into that. Um, I actually like this view. So this is if you were to use a scope and kind of your little camera and you're looking down into the respiratory tract. Uh, this is the epiglottis here, so it would kind of fold down and close this uh, when you're swallowing. But notice the two folds. Uh, right here are the false or vestibular folds. Again, sometimes they're called false vocal cords because they don't produce sound. And then here is the true vocal folds, which will be producing sound. Uh, this hole right here is basically called the glottis. Um, it's the opening kind of in between the vocal cords. All right. So again, that's just another view uh, giving you a little bit more appreciation of those uh, vocal cords. All right. So lower respiratory tract. So now we're coming down. There's that larynx again. This would be the thyroid cartilage, this little piece here would be the cricoid cartilage. This would be the trachea. Uh, the bottom of the trachea has a name. It's called the carina. Uh, that's basically where it's going to split into two, what we refer to as main or primary bronchi. Bronchus is singular. Uh, so you got two lungs, obviously, so you're going to have two main or primary bronchi. Then they're going to split. And when a main bronchus splits, it divides into however many lobes there are in that lung. So this left lung, you'll notice, has two lobes, one here and one here. So it's going to have two lobar, or secondary bronchi. Whereas over on the right, the right lung has three lobes, so it's going to have three lobar bronchi. So each lobe gets its own air supply from a lobar bronchus. Then within each lobe there are segments and each segment gets a segmental or tertiary
bronchus. Then we divide into a whole bunch of bronchioles. And there's a whole bunch of generations of bronchioles. Basically, we're getting more numerous and smaller until we get to the terminal bronchioles. But remember, terminal doesn't mean we're at the end. It means we're at the end of the conducting zone. Those terminal bronchioles will keep going into what's called the respiratory bronchioles. So what else can we see here? The left lung has a notch called the cardiac notch because it's got to make room for your, your heart. Right? Remember, your heart is primarily on the left side. That also is going to make this lung a little bit smaller. There's the diaphragm down here, so that's obviously going to be a super important respiratory muscle. We see here, I just kind of added this, there's going to be pressure in the lungs. We call that the alveolar or pulmonary pressure. There's also pressure in the cavity. So you got a cavity here called the pleural cavity. There's a pressure in there we're going to have to learn about called the intrapleural pressure. All right, and then there's a pressure in the atmosphere. So there's three places we're going to work on understanding pressure. Atmospheric pressure, alveolar pressure, and intrapleural pressure. Uh, so there's a membrane here. It's a serous membrane called the pleura. So just like other serous membranes, there's a visceral layer adhering to the lungs. And then there's a parietal layer. And in between is the pleural cavity. All right. Okay, that's probably a good place to take a little break. We'll start the next video and continue down that trachea and kind of look at a few more uh, details.